Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As a kid who grew up in the 1990s, I always looked forward to Sunday night. Does anybody will remember what happened on Sunday evening in the 90s? Wonderful world of the that's good. Football, some of you have good, good questions. For me as a kid, what I always looked forward to was this guy. <laughs> Bob Saget, America's Funniest Home Videos. Anybody ever seen it before? Some of you, right, remember that show, right? And I, I love this. This was like before the internet was really a thing, before funny videos could get shown all over the internet. And to watch people's funny videos or family tragedies that turned into comedic moments for the rest of the world to see, you had to tune in to Bob Saget on Sunday evening and you would watch America's Funniest Home Videos. So sometimes the videos would be like a, a grown adult on a children's toy here, rocking back and forth, face planting in the sand, and you'd watch it and you'd go, what in the world was he thinking? Right? Why in the world did he think that was a good idea? The one that I remember the most, and I remember the most, I think, because of how much my dad laughed when it happened was there was this video on America's Funniest Home Videos where a guy was mowing his backyard, but it was on a very steep incline in his riding lawnmower. I guess he was afraid it was going to flip over. So he tied a rope to his riding lawnmower to the top of the hill, and at the top of the hill was a children's swing set that was up there, and he tied his lawnmower to the swing set. And you guys can already see where this was going as he was mowing his lawn on this steep incline. Uh, the string held, but the swing set didn't. And the swing set and his riding lawnmower and him went rolling down the hill. And I can remember so clearly my dad saying, oh my, why did he think that was a good idea? What in the world was he thinking? And today, if you've never seen America's Funniest Home Videos, you probably don't need to because you can see all these videos all over the internet that are shared and emailed and texted and shared all over social media where you can look at people and maybe their tragic moments and you can laugh and you can say, what in the world were they thinking? Today, on this Reformation Sunday, we continue with our series, Forgive and Give where we are looking at the book of 2 Corinthians. And then we went through some of the context last week of what was going on. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians. It's not his second letter. It's at least his third, probably his fourth letter that he sent to them. And he writes this letter longing to be reconciled to them. He knows the love that Jesus has for him. He knows how he's been forgiven and been reconciled. And he knows he and the Corinthians, this church that he helped plant and start, were having a little bit of a rift. Because the Corinthians had gone after all of these other preachers. These preachers who were not preaching Jesus who had been crucified. God himself who had come in the flesh to suffer and die for you and me. But they were sort of preaching this prosperity gospel. These preachers were glamorous and charismatic and eloquent in everything they said. And they were leading people away from Jesus. Saying that Paul, this poor man who sold tents for a living, right, couldn't possibly be bringing the gospel. And Paul had written them a letter to remind them of what the gospel was that Jesus had suffered and, and been there in the mess and that his authority came from God. And we don't have that letter. We know it, it ruffled a few feathers and he's longing to be reconciled with them here in 2 Corinthians. But we also know that as, as Paul lived his life as a minister of the gospel, as somebody who knew what Jesus had done for him, the world often looked at him like we do some of those videos that were on America's Funniest Home Videos and said, what in the world was he thinking? Right, he references this just before our reading today. Paul says, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Right, in our right mind, it is for you as he loved and served people. They, they liked that part, but when they looked at Paul's life of sacrifice 
in service. They looked at Paul and said, why would you live a life that's so generous? Why would you live a life that's so sacrificial? They thought he was out of his mind living a life that way. Why in the world would he do that? And Paul begins to answer that just before our reading today. He says, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And He died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. Paul here clearly points back to Jesus. He says, you want to know why we live these lives of sacrifice and generosity that the world looks at us and says, what in the world were they thinking? The love of Christ compels us. Because Jesus Himself left the comforts of heaven, was born and laid in a manger, and suffered on your behalf and on my behalf that we might have life, that we might be ushered into a new creation and have forgiveness in life. Paul says that changes how we live. Rather than living lives for ourselves, we live lives for Jesus where we reflect His generosity and His love and His sacrifice to the world around us. And when the world sees that, and when we see that by the world standards in our own lives, we're tempted to ask the question, why in the world would you do that? What in the world are you thinking? It doesn't make sense. But that's the power of God. It's this one of sacrifice and giving, and that's what Jesus has done for you. Now, I was thinking about this. And I've gotten to know a lot of people in the church since I've gotten active in the church. And when I talk about church, I'm not just talking about here at Messiah. There are certainly people like this here at Messiah. But if you look at the church at large, and as I've looked at Christians throughout my life, I've seen this. Oftentimes, Christians, they live these lives of humble service in which the world around them says, why in the world would they do that? They must be out of their mind. I can remember one lady that I once knew. She was in her 80s. And she had started when she was in her 60s, about 20 years earlier, some inner city programs for children. And she was there every single day, Monday through Friday, helping run these inner city programs for at-risk children, sharing with them the love of Jesus. And I can remember one time her family had invited her to go out on this fancy cruise And she declined to go on the cruise. And when her family asked her why, she said, I need to be there for the kids. Her family looked at her like she was out of her mind, but it was the love of Christ for those children that she served in that humble way. I can remember a man I once knew who every Saturday morning, he had a Bible study in his home for two or three other people. It wasn't very big. And one time I got college football tickets. His favorite team was not the Gators, believe it or not. His team was not. But his favorite team was in town that week, and somebody had given me free tickets to that game. And I invited him to come with me, and he looked at me and said, sorry, I can't come because I have that Bible study. And I remember, I was a pastor at the time, I remember thinking, what in the world are you thinking? It's your favorite football team. Give up the Bible study. Come on. And he said, no. I didn't tell him that. I said, he said, no, th- those guys need me. A couple of those guys that he had been there with had, were going through a lot. He said, they need Jesus. They need that time. I can't miss out on that. Throughout my, my life as a Christian, I've seen this time and time again where there is a young married couple who are both working some very professional jobs, bringing in all sorts of money, and then all of a sudden they have a child And one of the parents decides to maybe take a step back at work or maybe stay at home with the child for some time. And the other parent maybe gives up their high-paying job that causes them to travel all over the world so that they can spend more time with their kids at home. And their friends look at them and say, what in the world are they thinking? Why in the world would they do that? Well, it's the love of Jesus that compels us to live these lives of sacrifice. And it's absolutely beautiful. And and that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. The world is looking at him like he's crazy, and he's saying it's the love of Jesus that compels us to do this. On this Reformation Sunday, right, people were saying that about Martin Luther, right? Why did he rock the boat? Why did he nail those 95 theses on the door? 
Well, he wanted you and me, he wanted everybody to know how much God loved them. That Jesus himself died and was raised, and it was him alone that ushers in this new creation of forgiveness and grace. He wanted you and me to know that it's the love of Christ that compelled him to do that. And that's what we celebrate on this Reformation Sunday. Right? Because that's what Jesus does. He lives in a way not by the powers of the world, but he lives in a way where he lowers himself to serve you and love you and bring you into a new creation. Right? That's what the Apostle Paul here says in our reading. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I love this. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation because you are part of the new creation, because I am part of the new creation, because Jesus died and rose for you, because your standing in the world is not based on how much money you make or how great your family is or whatever the world puts on you, but based on Jesus, you are part of the new creation, and now you and I are free to love and serve as ministers of reconciliation as ambassadors of reconciliation who go out in the world with that message of grace that God is for them, that God has died and been raised, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. That's what Paul is longing for the Corinthians and you and I to see. Probably, I looked this up, it was about four or five years ago I played a video and I'm not going to play it again. It's a documentary. I've played it in Bible study a few times. But when I think of ambassadors of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation that God has ushered us into, I think of a woman by the name of Ludmilla. Ludmilla, I don't know who she is. She was on a video that I watched, a documentary produced by a company called Daydox, D-E-I-D-O-X. You can go to their website and watch it for free. And it was a documentary about this woman who grew up in Eastern Europe. And she grew up and she lived... Um, basically under the Nazis, and then she lived under the control of the Russians pretty much her whole life, but she was a Christian. And she lived this life of humble sacrifice. She didn't have a lot of things. She had this small apartment that she lived in, and on the door of her apartment, or the, the front porch of her apartment, so to speak, she had this little plaque that said, Embassy to the Kingdom of Heaven. Embassy to the Kingdom of God. And as she lived her life, she lived her life basically where anybody that needed something could stop by her house and she served that need. So if somebody was hungry, even if she didn't have a lot of food, she'd find a way to give you a plate of food. If somebody needed a prayer or was just going through a tough time and needed a woman to talk to, she would sit there on her front porch or in her living room and speak to you and pray with you and be there for you. She lived this life of humble sacrifice. It's this beautiful story, but I love that image that her home was an embassy of the kingdom of God, that other people might experience the grace and the love that she and you and I have experienced. And that's my hope for you and me, that you would experience and know you're part of the new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You have been forgiven, and that God would fill you with his spirit, and you would live out that ministry of reconciliation, bringing that hope to the world around you as an ambassador in his kingdom. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life of